All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, hopefully, you had a good holiday. All right, I am recording. So, I'm gonna little backtrack a little bit before I move forward. I'm gonna use. I built a little environment so I can show you some of this stuff because I think it was a little bit um, for somebody. If you haven't dealt with it before, you can kind of get a familiar with some of the networking concepts. So, I made a little environment for you using. Um, um, uh, packet tracer. So, and I think what I'll do from now on is I'll just YouTube everything because I think that's easiest for everybody rather than upload it to the web ser to the server and then have you download it. I'll just YouTube it, and that way you can just watch the YouTubes um, at your convenience. So, all right. Has anybody tried the labs out? The um, the virtual labs. Just click a little hand raise there. If anybody tried them. I'm trying them yet. Okay, they're kind of cool. Very helpful. All right. So let, let me go over some of the concepts we were talking about. What I built here is some little home network with a wireless router, basically what you would get from an ISP. I just came up with this little one here to make it easy. Um, something you would be familiar with looking at. And on this side is your ISP. So basically at home you'd have some kind of access point, which is your router. Um, I put the bunny ears on it to show you we're going to do a little bit of security with the laptop. You got a PCs, and I put a little sniffer here. Okay, so what a sniffer does is I can watch all the traffic going from this PC to this uh, router and then out again. So I won't hear traffic um, since this is a switch um, on this on this, and I can show it to you. The physical it is I am plugged into one of these switch ports. This is the internet side, which is connected to the ISP on this side. Um, so the ISP is on this side. I've got four switch ports here then my laptop's coming across on the wireless. So I've got this set up like a little home network um, um, setting. On this side, the ISP, I've got a DNS server. Um, good that the ISP would give you uh, an IP address for. I got a DHCP server that the ISP is providing for your wireless for your router, and I got a little web server out here that's hanging that you can connect to. So let me give you some kind of the concepts we were covering because in the text, because before I go these commands which I left off on, I want to kind of make sure you got the idea of how this works. Um, just some basic concepts. Um, to make sure that um, you got what's going on. Okay, so let's do some basic um, networks. So, okay, so let's take a look at that config. So I got one, two, two physical PCs hooked to this router at home, and basically our home network, that are hooked off the switch. So they're in uh, because it's a switch. What layer of, um, of the OSI model or TC uh, of the OSI model is a switch? Layer two, very good. Which means it own it. The switch is aware of this Mac plugged into it and this Mac. If these two want to conversate, they will only connect to each other and nobody else. All right. If I had another. Um, PC in here wouldn't be aware of it. So in here it keeps a uh, ARP table. Um, ARP ta it keeps not an ARP table, but it keeps a port to MAC address. So let's take a look at our PC. Right now I've got it running. So I'm running a little DHCP server in here just to kind of show you what what you would on a wireless. So I'm running a little DHCP server here. And it's going to give them addresses 192.168.0.100.149. So I've got a little DHCP server running off my router that's coming in. And I look here. Here's the command prompt to the PC. And I do IP config. And it tells me I got 0 0.104. There's my subnet mask. Okay. So you got your zero, your subnet mask, and I I got a default gateway of zero one, which happens to be that router. Um, so um, I think you can also do. I don't remember. 
you can get also your additional information. So I did IP config all on that same one. And now I can get some specifics. I can get my IP, I can get my DHCP server, which happens to be the router as well. I got a DNS server. The DNS server I've got set up is the ISP would be out here giving you a DNS entry. Is everybody familiar with what DNS means? Yeah, domain name server. So I have an entry and I'll show you how DNS works um, for the ISPs. So these machines um, are aware of this server out here giving it giving them the DNS. The DNS I put one mapping in it so that it knows that this web server is here. Therefore I can type in a URL field and I'll show you to pull up this web server because this this is telling it when it does a lookup and we'll use like one of the commands called let us look up to resolve the IP. Okay, and DHCP naturally is um, dynamic host configuration protocol. That's what's giving um, you an, an address from your ISP. Okay, they're providing it to you. Okay, and this side all your addresses are provided by this little router here through this interface. Okay, so it's providing the addresses here. So your little and it's getting its uh, address, its IP address from the ISP. So on this side is the inter is the ISP. I got the internet provided here by this server, and on the inside here, I've got a, the DHCP is right here, and it's providing to your local little machines. Okay. So some basic information there. So when you look at it, now I should be able to do very simple things. If I have connectivity, I should be able to ping around. Okay, so if this one is all set up correctly, um, let's say this one should be, oops, escape, da, 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 0104. I should be able to ping and get a reply. So what ping is, is I'm sending messages or protocol to it. I happen to have the sniffer running, so then I can see what is actually going on. So let me open my little sniffer, and I can see some of the traffic. Let me clear this. i got to do it again. So much bug. The GUI's been running for a while. So that little sniffer will watch the traffic. So I'll make sure I know which one I'm on. This is... I'm on 104. I want to go to 105. I pinged myself. That was terrible. <laughs> 105. So now what my sniffer is picking up is you can see I'm si I did an ARP, okay, which means I this is the actual what it, uh, traffic would look like. I did an ARP. It said who has this basically, and here is that ICMP. These are the pings that are going out. So they're saying, uh, tell me who you are, tell me who you are, are you there, are you there, are you here. So I went from 104 to 105, and I'm getting a response. That's what they call ICMP type traffic. ARP is when I query who has this. Okay, that's what a query, what an ARP query is. But you can actually watch what's going on when you did that. I did four pings, I got four pings, four responses. So you can see, I can watch the traffic. Yes, I put it in line so I can see. I can also, um, now that I, these are all connected, they talk to each other. Okay, and they all have an IP. I also have set up here a wireless device. So I have a wireless laptop. So I can open it up, show you what it looks like physically. It's got the little wireless dongle on it. And it's set to DHCP. So it's getting an address from my wireless router. And if I go to the desktop, I can see that I am connected. It is active and connected. So I could refresh. It's a little slow when it does this. Okay, so it finds the network again. I've got a mixed BGNN, so that's what the basic setup here is. So if I go to my wireless, it's on mixed BGNN. I didn't set it to anything. Um, it's SSID is, is how it's defined as default. right? So it sees it as default. So I could change that name. I could call it, you know, uh, Internet. Net. And I could just basically save that. And now 
I can go back here and refresh it. This takes a while. Let's do. It's checking again. Okay, so now it found internet. Notice it now disconnected because it changed SSID. SSID is the broadcast ID of what this connection should be. So I say I want to connect the internet. Okay. Now I did a little something too that you saw often here. We talked a little bit about security. Um, if you look on on your wireless security, I turned on the wireless security. I have it on WPA2 Personal, which is what usually you use at home, and I put it. I made it as AES encryption, and I put this default passphrase in here. So now, when I want to connect to that, it says, "What is the password?" Password one two three. Connect. Okay. Do, 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 do. Now I should get a connection. And I do. So now my little, my laptop is now connected. I can then look at my desktop again. I'm done with this. Go to my command prompt. I say IP config slash all. And it gives me a 103 from that same DHCP server right here that I'm running on setup. So it's all set. So now you get the concept that you have DHCP. I have, a, and I also am serving out that that's the DNS address. Okay. The reason I need that address is so I can do the next couple things. Okay. So right now, all these are connected through my router at home, and I'm connected to the internet to my to the ISP. Okay, I just put a switch here to make it convenient to connect up all the devices. <laughs> okay, so this is not supplying addresses to anybody here. This little router is. Okay, this wireless is connecting this laptop, and you can see the traffic. I showed you some traffic using a sniffer. Now. DNS, as I said, is the way you resolve things. So let me go to the DNS service here. So what it is, is you have records, or it's like the yellow pages of the internet. So you have records in a DNS server that tells you where things are, and it's constantly updated. I just happen to put the IP address of this web server here that I created. Okay, So I put it there so I could look it up by its name rather than just its IP. Now I'm going to go back to my server here, not server, my little PC here, and I'm going to ask using very simple, I'm going to say where is nslookup is the command. I say okay I'm talking to my DNS server 51, that's this little server here, right here, he's number 51, that's his IP, and that's the ISP's DNS, and I say um, resolve basically web. Okay, it says web should be number 52. That's what I have in the record for the DNS. So then that means I can go to my web browser here and I could type, you know, if I wanted to remember all the URLs 64.1.1.52 and say, hey, that's the website. And it works. I'm pulling up the web page on the other server. Okay, and it is the web page of the server. Okay. Now, but I don't like doing that. We do it by words. So I say the name of that server is web. Pull it up. HTTP web and it comes up. I could I also turned on HTTPS and that also works. So both come up and I have the with the web page, a very default little <laughs> Cisco web page that there's there. Okay. Now note that as I do that you can see what I'm doing. Okay. So when I'm connecting to a web server, it's TCP. What's special about the TCP? Why do what what is special about TCP? Was it different from UDP? It establishes a connection, a guaranteed reliable connection. So it makes sure if for every packet it it requests, it gets a, it does a handshake, a three-way handshake. That was a connection and ensures that it always gets the packets back. So that if it's missing something, it will go get it. So here's an HTTP request. Okay, so I went to the server and asked for H and did an HTTP request. And I could see what the traffic uh, looked like. It said it was okay. Yeah, I'm all set. Notice I did a DNS query as well. 
DNS query, meaning I'm talking to the DNS server and getting some address information, which came back as what is the web server's address. I also establish an HTTPS, which means it's a secure connection over SSL 443. Okay, and you can see that the ports change, okay, depending on what I'm doing. 53 is for DNS. HTTP is port 80. Those are the requests I'm making out. Okay. If you look at my web server, all it's doing is showing you a web page. <laughs> That's all it's designed to do. Okay. I could edit any number of services, but for now I just had a little web server. So then there's many web servers on the internet. I just happen to throw this one here just for fun to show you how DNS DHCP works. Um, it's like DHCP, um, which is that this server is running, is dulling out what the ISP would give you a public address. On the inside here, we have a private address. Okay, these are private addresses. So this router is doing natting. It's translating between these privates to this public. Okay, so I can hook up different devices, but I and I go through the router and it translates it to this one public IP that I'm assigned. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? I just kind of built a little network to kind of show you what's going on. Kind of cover all the concepts. Anybody not make sense? Yes. What's your question? I saw the hand go up. Oh, you're good. Okay. All right. I encourage you, what I usually do in class is I'll build this uh, with the students. I have them download. Now, Packet Tracer is not on the A-plus exam, but I download it and um, use it to demonstrate the concepts. I have them build this little network with me um, as we go through. Okay. That way, um, they kind of understand now, you know, what's going on, how to set up a wireless access point, um, what is, um, you know, IP DHCP, what is DNS. You know, I could even put a DNS server on the inside here that I could put all these names in that and they could look them up by their name. Okay, so that kind of, I could do a lot with this, but this is just a very simplistic way of showing them that here's the outside, you got a public IP, here's your, D this one's doing DHCP, the, the ISP gives you one of his DHCP, his or her, her DHCP addresses, DNS is the way you connect out to the internet, this is your yellow pages, this is how you find things, I just happen to create this web server out there for them to show them that I can resolve it. You know, anything I put in here can be resolved then by DNS. Okay. All right, cool. And I put the sniffer to show them what kind of traffic goes through because sometimes it's kind of obscure of what you're actually doing. I just put a little. That way you can watch what the computer is asking and watch what's coming back. All right, cool. So there's some basic ways of teaching it. Um, you can come up with other different ways, but that's basic ways of doing it. Okay. I mean, this this can be as simple as taking two PCs and putting a crossover cable across them and they'll talk. Okay, and then also to understand what a gateway address is, you know, that the gateway is right here and the gateway is here. You know, what is your gateway? Where do you go? How do you get off this network through this, this doorway here? So, and knowing what that doorway number is versus just the IP and the uh, subnet mask to make sure they're on the same network. Okay. All right. Cool. Close up some of these windows. They got all kinds of traffic going on here. All right. And having a wireless point there that you can just kind of set up and show them, you know, security. I could put the firewall protection on. Um, I mean, you can do quite a bit with this inside of uh, inside of there that you can emulate. And there are labs from Cisco on it. I just didn't assign them because it's really not a packet tracer class. You will use a lot, but so a couple of things: IP config, release, renew, flush DNS, register. So basically, I did these before, but I can do them in a simulator here in the. In the Network. So if I go and bring up my command prompt, okay. Let 
the only thing, it doesn't take all the DOS commands. It's the only thing. You just keep scrolling. Anyways, um, let me do IP config release. So if I want to let go of my IP, now I have no IP on this one. And then I can renew, which I'm asking the little router, which running a DHCP server, give me back an IP. So now I have a new I, I have the same IP because it was a short distance. Um, I could also display DNS requests. Okay, it doesn't support it inside the emulator. Okay, does it on a real machine. And then... Um, you can do still IP config all to show you all your connections and more detailed information inside the emulator. So you can uh, demonstrate that IP config, and in Linux it's called IF config, but IP config gives you quite a bit of options. Ping we did that's ICMP the test whether or not you have an echo echo reply. Now this does not mean that the system is down if it doesn't reply they may be blocking by firewall but it's just to kind of test it out the net commands and I doubt this thing supports the net commands I'll do it on my machine yeah they don't do the net commands so we do it on my machine so let's do the net commands so what net commands are they're built in okay let me do it this way they're an administrator's tool, so you can get quite a bit with the net commands. You can see what shares are, are running. Um, you can get the time of the network if there's a time server running. I don't know if they've got time server anywhere. You can query out to see. D D D D. I doubt it. Nah, there's no. I'm doing NTP requests. There's no. There's no net time out there. Yeah, I didn't think so. Uh, but I can do net u, and this will take a while to review to show all the net. So this shows all the machines on the network that I can talk to so far by using net view. Could also do like net statistics, statistics, uh, net statistics, and I can get statistics on the workstation service. Just got a note that says workstation and server because you're both a workstation and can become a server. You can share files. So I can see how many bytes received, how many SMB connections there were, how much transmitted. So I can get some information. Um, it's not quite like uh, Netstat, different from Netstat, more extensive on a Netstat. Um, but there were three hung sessions that I had to kill. So it kind of gives you kind of a little bit of network statistics based on um, what it knows. If you went to that site I gave you, SS64, let's see if I have it up here. I'm going to close it. SS64, you can get a list of these commands. To make a ready reference, so like the net commands, they kind of help you all the different start, stop, pause, continue, net use to connect to a file for drive mapping. Um, these are all available to, to read, and you can get kind of more information about them. Uh, so if we had a net time server, I could get information about time. The real common one is net use to, for mapping a lot of. Um, of uh, administrators use it instead of using you know map a network share in the GUI they just type this out to do it so and those are the basics of net commands so let's see where we are back to where we are in the curriculum so those are the net commands and then net dome now this is actually not there by default um, they said well it's there by default not by default and all it's part of a remote access thing so um, it's part of a toolkit Windows 10 might have it I'll have to double check real quick whether or not it has it I can check right now um, let me see if Windows 10 runs it natively um, otherwise you gotta add it as an add-on yeah NetDome is not 
um, there natively. It's an add-on. They usually have used it for servers, but uh, it's managed computer, joint computers to a domain um, if you had a domain. So this is the idea with NetDome. Um, if you have a domain, you can manage um, your domain with it. Domain is just a group of computers that are all managed by a central server, and all accounts are managed there. So NetDome is one of those types of commands that are that you use to manage them from the command line. Okay. The other thing we talk about with networking, they talk about MBT stat. Okay, is everybody familiar with NetBIOS is? Shouldn't be using it anymore, but it's still around. No, so NetBIOS. No? Okay, so NetBIOS has been around for a long time. It's not necessary. It's because we used to use it to map by name. We don't need to map that way anymore. We can just use DDNS to do a dynamic DNS where you register your machines into your DNS server rather than use that, the NetBIOS. Though it is on on most machines, um, they haven't success they haven't really turned it off. Um, you can double check if they still support the command. Yeah, they still support it in Windows 10. Um, they still support the command. Whether or not you have it on is another issue. But NetBIOS is how one machine finds it can find another. It also is a very chatty um, kind of protocol. So I can show you what it does. So by using NBD stat, knowing the IP of a machine, so I'll just do it here. So I go do it on my own machine. This is what's being chatted out. It says what the name of my machine is. Um, it tells you that what I know. This is the name of my machine, and it tells me what um, domains I'm joined to. Also gives a MAC address of the network card that it's using. Um, this information is way too much you want to share. Generally, we block NetBIOS traffic on the border. Um, on the on the border firewall, you don't want people because people are using this information to break in, uh, especially since you have the MAC information right there being broadcast across the wire. Okay, we don't really need a NetBIOS anymore, but it is supported on some for legacy purposes. Uh, a lot of this information could easily be stored in the DNS server and be uh, and can be queried that way rather than using NetBIOS. But it's been around f since Windows uh, NT days. Um, it's been around for basically to resolve things. Um, it's a remote machine's name table or how they resolve one machine to another. Um, but it's important to know it's there. Um, trace route, and this is basically to trace, they're based on time to live, so I can actually do this in here. This should support it. It should be trace RT. Trace RT, and I'll say I want to go to the 64.1.1.52. So I'm tracing the route from me, um, this little PC. It should be able to trace the route over to the web server. So it says I went um, starting from 64 where I'm at. I went through the 192.1601, which is this router here. And then I ended up over here. So there was only one router in between me and it. Now across the internet you have many, many different routers. Um, how would you block them from using NetBIOS? You could turn off NetBIOS in your in your settings, or you can just block it at the firewall. It's 137 ports 137, 138, 139. You can block them, or you just turn it off in uh, your card settings. Um, so if you go in your con uh, not your control panel. Uh, yeah, you can do it in your control panel. Network and sharing. Change your adapter settings. Look at your network adapter. If you're not using that BIOS in the environment for any particular re reason, um, you can turn it off. It doesn't break anything unless you're using it for something. So by default, this is always on. Okay, that's a default setting. You can just disable it, and it doesn't shouldn't it shouldn't affect anything. Okay. Unless you had some legacy stuff running. The other way is to uh, block it at your internet connection. Block it here where there's no net bias traffic going out. Okay. That's how you would block it. Okay. 
So traceroute, basically, you can see I took one hop over this router, went to the other side, and found a server. Now, no, we know that it's a lot farther. Um, we use traceroute, you know, like trace route, and I want to go to Google. So that's going to take several hops. So that'll run for a little while. <laughs> okay. Take a look at our sniffer traffic when we ran it. Okay, notice it's my CMP. Let me clear that and do that again on this one. You can see my I took several hops, 12 hops before I got to Google. Um, so I went across several different routers across the internet uh, out of our building through our main pipes and then out to get to Google. Um, the traffic is kind of interesting if you look at what it's actually doing. Do that command again. So it does the hops. Let's see what the sniffer sees. Notice it's ICMP traffic. That's what it's using to determine the hop count. It's using TTL, time to live. Um, how long the package should live because it has to go and die out eventually because it would infinitely go looking for something. TTL 1, TTL 225, and it then decrements it down until it just find, until it finds it. If it finds it, we're good. So, um, but basically uses ICMP to find what's going on, to find the, the, the hops you're taking to get to where you got to go. Um, so that's where these times come back. It's measuring the time it takes to get there. Make sense so far? So trace route shows you. There's some visual ones that I could sometimes show students. You can put them on the internet um, to make it more interesting because it changes depending on time of day. So depending on where I want to go and time of day. So here's our remote track. Host trace it. So you can see I made it. It's jumping all over. So I started here. Took six hops okay, to get to where I got to go. Now, I may not have taken the same route. I took 12 hops doing it here. I took only six here. Depending on where you are and what it's doing, you can see how many hops it takes. And it may not look, you know, it's going to uh, Bellevue, Washington, but getting there, it's kind of interesting. This could change on a daily basis because routers change on their routes. So if I go to um, famu.edu, FAMU post trace. Should be interesting when it resolves. It took seven hops. So on here. doesn't show any response here and it ends up here on Edgewater. Sometimes it doesn't show all the hops because there's no response from them. So it's kind of interesting. It's jumping around, but we don't get it, you know. So, so it's kind of interesting when you when you watch it. Some nights it'll go one way, some some will go another. All right. So it's only showing it's showing me the won't show me in between. It shows me the endpoints, but it doesn't show me everything in between. So it shows me from two to eight, <laughs> but it took a couple hops. So um, I'm gonna call it the. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So you can kind of use that to kind of show them where things go. That the routes could change too on a nightly basis, depending on what the routers know. Know they can switch around and move them to different places, trying to get to the location. So that's trace route. And as look up, we just did. You can look up. This is querying your DNS server that it knows of to get an IP address back. So you know. Yeah, CLS. So, like, if I type in as lookup, this is the local one here. I'm calling up mine here at Moraine Valley. I could always say Google.com, and it's going to come back with a non-authoritative answer. This is what's cached for Google. Now, I could stick this in my URL field, and it'll work. If I don't type Google.com in my browser, I could always type that. Now, what's kind of interesting is you can see the actual traffic. If I do that, and sometimes I show students this when I do this, 
that's all that's going on between you and a DNS server. <laughs> that's the actual communication you're having. It's a long conversation. You're querying, and it's going to go and dis um, discover if it's in its cache. It's going to send traffic back. It sends about six responses before it finally gives you the answer um, you desire at the end. Um, but it does quite a bit of uh, querying. It's a recursive lookup. Um, it's going to go around and say, is this the IP address? And it comes back finally. So you can see there's quite a bit of traffic that goes on when you do that command. You just don't notice it. <laughs> so. All right. So those are some of the basic commands that you need to know. This one's really only if you're a domain admin would you use this. This one an administrator can use to connect stuff. And, and ping we use commonly on IP config. Let's move forward. So there is a whole thing I and they will demonstrate here if you want to. I sometimes have the students watch this to kind of get used to the network, see all commands, but I also have them do them um, because I think it's useful if you type it, you tend to remember it. So connecting to a router, once again, I just set up a little network for you to show you what it would look like. But you can do the labs if you want, um, just to kind of have them practice what it looks like. And remember, a, a router is a layer what device? A router like this is a layer 3. Very good, right? So we got a layer we got a layer three device. Switches are layer two. And we got a layer three. Now I could have threw a hub in there, which is a layer one, but I didn't need to. <laughs> and I wouldn't have had to do much because I wouldn't need that. The hub would tell me all the traffic I needed. Okay, so I did this already. I did a very basic one for you, and this is just for practice. Um, configuring and you could do this either with a real wireless access point or you could do it with the lab uh, um, if you have real equipment if you can't don't have real equipment um, and not everybody does you can basically set it up um, using here because you have a wireless access point you have several you can use and this tool comes with the class you download it um, you have several networking type devices um, you can use and I'm not even showing you everything I mean this thing has newer tools now they have cell towers and all that um, home gateways you know central office servers um, but this is quite expanded it comes with the class but they're not tested on it in terms of um, a plus of how to use Cisco uh, packet tracer but it's useful tool to teach them some basic networking that's what I use it for okay connecting to a wireless router which I showed you test the wireless NIC did that okay these are all labs in it okay so let's talk about domains and work groups. So a domain, as I said, is a group of computers all hooked together with accounts. Um, so the idea, when you have a domain environment, and I, well, I'm on a domain, so, so the idea here is you have some kind of what they call directory service. So let me draw this. So I always tell the students, here's how I explain it to my students, so they kind of get the idea. So I have a computer little computer here and I log in every day I put a username slash password every day to get in okay at home most people do this okay you put your username and password now say you had another user you want to use so you put another user in here and they get their own username and password on this machine Okay, so there's only two to maintain, and you know another one. So as you get more and more users, each user has to log into this. They have a username and password. This becomes quite unmanageable. Okay, so what if I could come up with a way to manage all their usernames and passwords from a central location? So I put up a server. Okay that has some kind of directory service. Now we some common one that we hear about is Active Directory from Microsoft. It's not the only one. But say we have an Active Directory. So server 2012 say or 2008 whatever has Active Directory. Okay, we could have an 
an LDAP server if you're into Linux or Unix you could have that too. And all it is is it's a way to store. So I'm going to take all these usernames and passwords and I'm going to put them here. So they're going to be centrally managed here. So I have them all here. Okay, so they're all here. They're no longer here. They're all up here. Okay, I then effectively add this machine to a list of machines that this thing manages. So now there's a list of machines inside here that this thing manages. And there's a list of users and passwords it manages. So when a user steps up to the keyboard and types their username and password, they actually, the machine goes to the main AD server or the main uh, directory server. They call them directory servers is what they are. Directory. Can't spell very well. Oh, there you go. Directory server says, "Are you the user in here? And is that the right user and password? If it is, it then allows the user to log in. Okay. The they no longer log in what they call locally. Okay. They log in into the into the Active Directory or into the directory service. So now this poses some interesting issues. So accounts that were local here are no longer there. They're all up here." So that means if they had administrative privileges here, they no longer have them. Okay, um, they are removed because all your accounts are up here. They no longer have the privilege to log in and change things as an administrator here if they did so in the past. Okay, because they no longer have a local account here. All the authentication, and they call it authentication, authentication comes from the central Active Directory server. That's a domain. That, having that, you can then issue um, policies. So, oh, I forgot to type the whole thing out. So, when you have a, I know what I'll do it this way. So, what happens is, once I have something like that from the central server, and I'm just going to emulate it here because I don't have a server running. Out all my good tools out of this thing. Yeah, here we go. Groupology object. Okay. And this would this particular tool. Okay. So if I was the server, I could then for all machines in my control that are that I control, I can set user configs and I could set computer configs. So I can then from a central server and I'm just emulating it here, um, I can set up a bunch of policies and settings. So if I want to, I can set up all kinds of security settings. So like account policies. I could say everybody who connects, who logs in, has to have some, how, so they, it remembers three of your last passwords. So that whenever you log in, if it asks you to change your password, it knows all three of the last ones. You can't reuse passwords. I could set how long um, the password should be. I could say how long before you have to change it. I could say if it's got to be complex. And I can manage all this from a central server um, through right here. Okay. And then I could also, you know, set like lockout policy. If you type the password wrong so many times, I could lock you out. Okay. And then I could also um, set other policies on users themselves. I could have other types of policies I want to set um, if I wish. I can set things on their desktop that are allowed or not allowed. 
Um, I could remove certain icons, whatever, and I can apply them down to all the machines in my realm, all the ones that I control. So that's the idea of a domain. The idea is you can control the user and the computer. I can say you can only log in, you know, from these hours only, from 9 to 5. You can't log in before 9, you can't, and it logs you out at 5. So, and only Monday through Friday. Or I could restrict you to one computer. So that's the idea of a domain. It's basically a centralized control. Okay. As opposed to a work group, where a work group is just a bunch of machines hooked together and there's no central authority. So yours computer one, computer two, and like I said, everybody would then have local users and accounts on each one. So in order for you to use another computer, right now what a what a domain, if I want to use another computer, no big deal. If there's another one here and it's in the same domain, provided there is no restriction, I can use my username and password on it and log in use it into this through the into the network using that. With a work group I cannot. A work group is just a bunch of machines. So I got a bunch of computers. They're all hooked together. Okay. However they're hooked together. But they each have local control. So their usernames and passwords all exist locally. And so if I want to log on to this machine, somebody has to give me an account on it because I only have an account on this machine here. So there's no central authority in that case. And that's the idea with the work group. So how to connect, they give you the settings and basically it's the properties on the settings so if I do da, 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 da. under computer name you can see I am joined already to a domain so I'm on the active directory for Moraine Valley um, I could change and drop it to a work group but then that would take away rights I have on the domain and certain pieces of software probably wouldn't work because like office and that to check against the central server for a key um, wouldn't work but this is where they're saying you could change the settings okay. the network ID at home you have what's called the home group um, this is a home network you can make a little group um, for home settings um, to share um, I never like this feature but it's there <laughs> some people like it for home use but basically you can uh, being part of a whole group you can share music and that it's a little bit easier than having to do it the other way which is uh, you know having to um, share things using um, People get confused by it because you know. Then you you know this is where we do it on a corporate network, but in a home group it makes it a little bit easier to share things across the home group. But having to map things, which gets confusing to some people. Same idea, sharing in Windows Vista. Okay, and I just showed you about mapping the drive. So you would share something. Um, so like if you do a share, I'm going to do that. So I create something like a folder. And I can, I look at its properties. Properties. So one thing I can do with it, I can set sharing. And I could share it out there and say um, who has permission. I can add people to have access to the share. So I'm the only one who has access to it. So I can share it. And now it's shared out there on a network okay? um, that people could connect to it. Only I have permission to connect to it. I might have to tell people about it and then give them permission to connect to it. But it is a share. So if I go to computer management, and there is a lab on this um, in the virtual on sharing, creating shares and making shares. And I can 
go to my shared folders shares okay DR shares by default that you don't see uh, let me get out of here get too many panels open close the panel I wanted I've got shared folder then look at the shares out there so there's a so several default shares okay that are out there your drives actually shared this dollar sign means it's invisible uh, sessions no open files it's not showing my share yet uh, your folder is shared done I could set customs on it there we go should come back and show me the share. There it is. Had to shut it. So there's that share I just created. You know, you, this is a general share and I do advanced sharing. But now it's shared so you can see my machine is now sharing that. And then I can set, you know, specific per permissions. This is shared. I can say how many people can act. I can set further permissions. You can only read it and so forth and so on. But the idea is creating a share out there that people can use. Okay, we're not going to share this folder anymore. This is the general permission, so we'll get rid of it. And now it's gone. Okay, it's just general permission. Okay. Cool. So the idea of sharing stuff, and that's what they're talking about. Did the policy already? Nope. Close back to where we were so you can see some of the stuff you can do so I did that okay. there are like I said certain shares that have the dollar sign they're invisible they're called administrative shares but if you are running like if you are in charge of a domain you could open up somebody's C drive as long as you have permission remotely and look in it they're when you see a dollar sign, anything with a dollar sign, those are specially administratively shared. Okay, they don't. If that if they you remove that dollar sign, they won't be shared anymore. But administrators in general have full access. Map a network drive. You do as a lab. The idea is to connect to a share somewhere else. And there's a video on it. Unless I have them do this in the in the lab, the virtual labs and that labs. VPNs, these are fun. So virtual private networks. Okay. So the idea is I have um, a corporate network. Um, I don't know, this one I haven't played enough with it to tell you if it supports VPN. I think it does. Um, I think there's a VPN service inside here. One of these thought it did. Justin knows better than I do what all the new features are. But I, you can set up a VPN um, server. They now support Internet of Everything devices, so it's an interesting. I could have sworn I had VPN on this, some of this, but anyways. Thought I saw it. Triple A, FTP, VM management. Eh, they're here nor there. Um, I heard this. You could set up a VPN connection if you set up a VPN server, basically. Um, the idea is how do you use um, the internet privately? idea with a VPN. So I'm a, you're traveling and you want to get to your company's network or your, your place of employment's network and how do you do it in a secure way? So they set up what's called a VPN. Um, you, you set up a remote client um, connecting to a server. So the idea with a VPN and there's a lot to you know getting it all set up but you have your company network over here you're at a hotel, you're at a Holiday Inn or Best Western or Marriott or Hyatt or whatever and you want to get across the public um, internet 
privately so nobody steals the information. Well, on your corporate network, they'd have a server or a device that would be the VPN concentrator. And you're, you have to run a client, a VPN client. Now, Windows does provide um, their VPN client. It doesn't work with everything, but they do provide it. Some, some work with their VPN clients, some do not. Um, depends on it. On, uh, uh, like if you set up a new connection here, I can connect to a workplace, set up a VPN, and you could use my internet connection and then just go ahead. I just need the settings for it if I do, and say, well, what am I connecting to using the VP, using this client? And I have to know the settings for the other end. Or it could be proprietary where it's like only you have to use whoever this vendor is, um, their VPN client. What you're establishing is a secure tunnel. They call it a tunnel between you, wherever you are, public, out there, across the internet, to the VPN at your company. Once connected, the VPN will, will give you a connection that will also get you on the corporate network. You actually end up with two IPs, the one that's public that you have from where you're at, and a private one, the one that's from your company's um, network. Now, you are completely you're encrypted when you're going across the public internet. Okay, so the tunnel creates a crack. It's like yeah, drilling a tunnel through a wall. Okay, so no one can get in the tunnel. It's just you and the other end. Now, once you pass the VPN, you are now unencrypted. You're only in encrypted um, up to the VPN, and then after that, you're unencrypted. Unless they have something set up, you're unencrypted. So it's though you have a Ethernet cord that's miles and miles long. That you, it's a private connection between you and your company. That's the idea with a VPN, a virtual private network. Okay. Remote desktop. Has anybody ever used RDP? Remote desktop. There's a lot of commercial ones that do this. Yes. Okay. This is the one that's built into Windows, and there's a lab on it. So basically, you can remote, as provided you have permission, you can remote into somebody and help them by manipulating them. So they can ask for assistance, and you have to allow the remote connection to do so, um, so that you can um, go in and actually work with them. Um, there's a lot of services like this. Um, we block them all here, but <laughs> it's like log me in. Again, okay, it's a famous one for being able to remote access anybody anywhere. Um, there's Team Viewer. Once again, just so you can you could download it and um, use it to connect remotely to people. Um, there is um, Go to My PC. There's an endless number of remote de desktop. Uh, tools you can use to access people depending on what features you want and then how much you need cost wise now typically you know they have windows does have the big capabilities of um, doing remote desktop but only if it's allowed okay so you do have the capability it is built in for remoting okay um, you can't allow remote assistance or allow connections. Now they have to, you have to select the users who will have access and you have to allow it to go through. Um, you can't just randomly access somebody um, without their permission and or an account. Okay. You know, I've used all these kinds of different ones. They all work generally the same. Um, depending on what you want to want to do and what features you want. So the idea is remote desktop support. Okay, some briefing. So just a little background. So we had originally analog phones. Anybody ever have an analog phone? Rotary dial. <laughs> Not push button. Rotary. <laughs> All right, Mike, you've been around long as long as me. You just admitted it. <laughs> you had the fancy rotary dial. 
Alright, so that's what we had. <laughs> okay. So analog was the oldest one. Use the modem, a real modem, to dial up with those na naughty with those tones. They went so that was your original. You know. Now we use those analog lines to do DSL. We use the same lines, but we've learned how to use the more efficiently the frequency across those. They used to call this the POTS line or plain old telephone system. Um, and then we use that to send digital signals to our DSL. They did have at one time um, a all DS, uh, an all digital line, which was called ISDN. Um, it was uh, it was proprietary, where you had to pay for extra for that. Um, you would um, it was it was their first attempt before they even had DSL. They used ISDN. You don't see them too much now. Only used in certain circumstances now. Broadband is what we call now for the transmission over a broad range of frequencies. So now we have things like satellite, DSL, cable, and all that technology. Those are the broadband techs. Okay, so like a DSL, you have a DSL modem. It's using an analog line. So it's not like you're not. It says twisted pair, which is CAT3 type cable. That's what your phone line is. And you basically are connected across that. And it's, it does your voice if you have a real phone. Um, if you're using VoIP, it's just using the digital part, not, not the analog part. And you can surf the internet and you can make phone calls all the way to your ISP using the DSL, digital um, uh, s signal. Now this is a little deceiving. You don't go straight to your DSL. There's usually a DSLAM that you connect to, which is a concentrator, and then goes back to the central office. But um, this is asynchronous, which means you don't usually get the same performance. You get faster downloads and slower uploads unless you pay for synchronous. Usually it's slower to, to upload anything than download, because most people download rather than upload. Line of sight wireless um, connections. Um, you gotta have to be in range for that one. Um, they used to have um, an experiment like this um, off the John Hancock building here um, years ago. They you'd have a diamond receiver um, on your house, and you would project out 30 miles a radio signal to connect. Um, if but on a bad day, like fog or anything, you wouldn't get the connection. <laughs> Weather does have an effect. Uh, <laughs> so they were using it as a test to see how they could deliver internet wireless over a long range. And then we have WiMAX. Okay, so the WiMAX connection that's still around. Uh, microwave access. Uh, why did, so high-speed mobile. You see this up on large towers. They do WiMAX between towers. Um, they transmit. So we see this. Um, you see this out in a big field. You see WiMAX transmitters um, out there. And other broad tans, you got satellite, if you want to use satellite. Um, cellular, right, we have all the way up to 4G, now coming up on 5G. <laughs> we don't really have true 4G, we got pseudo 4G, but anyways, now we're going to have 5G. You know, I'm waiting for the 9G. Yeah, there's always got to be an extra number, right? <laughs> so we have cellular connections that we now use for, basically we use for internet speeds, provided you have a 4G in the area that you can connect to. Um, and we use them to transmit uh, data. So, GSM is the global uh, system for mobile. This is generally what they use. GSM type phones are AT&T and T-Mobile. Um, other phones may use CDMA and not GSM. Um, they just use the GSM to get on to 4G. Okay. Uh, radio service, general packet radio service for connecting uh, data service. Okay, you can also use it to get on different frequencies, so um, you can have quad bands, different frequency connects. You can connect the wireless with them now. This is all your phone system, um, which are cellulars. You have SMS, multimedia SMS. Um, you got Edge. When you can't find anything else, you get Edge. <laughs> or enhanced 3G, you're going to ask the BDA when you don't have much. So there's different ways you can connect to the internet depending on where you are. Okay, and then the old traditional cable, and cable connect, you go through the cable connector. Okay, finally with satellite up and down. Now we all want this, right? Google Fiber. 
<laughs> or whoever's fiber uh, um, Verizon was testing that f um, uh, uh, um, fiber to the residents uh, remember D Merck they were testing it for a while having fiber to your house or, you know fiber or optical cable mm, tremendous amount of speed <sighs> so fiber to the presence So depending, you know, this just kind of gives you connection details. And depending on where you are, it depends on what you can get. Um, D, um, DSL typical, uh, or in faster, the closer you are to a central office. Um, distance is a big thing. Okay. Cable, um, high speed down, slow up, they said, but you can buy or purchase quite a bit of speed now. Uh, satellite's always available. You got your cellular for mobile users. You could have a hot spot on your phone or carry a hot spot with you. Um, plain old telephone, your systems are all over the place. Um, uh, um, that's been around forever. <laughs> okay, DSL is just using the same line. It just uses a different frequency on the line. So you can also deliver by power, um, but they tip, they don't usually allow the the power company can actually deliver you a data signal across the power lines if they want it. But um, and they were cleared by the FCC, but you know they have too much competition out there to allow that. So so just to kind of know what dial up is, this is AOL. I always say dial up is the old AOL. <laughs> And why max that light all the different connections you can show them. And then finally we get to what the mighty data center. Okay, so um, data centers or clouds out there um, are all over the world, right? So we deal with Google. Google's a, a data center. We have many data centers. It's basically where all the, the, the large enterprises either have one or they outsource to a cloud provider which all that means is it's a data center somewhere that you're just using somebody's data center um, this is where you know many many servers are connected together um, like Google and you got drive sharing all that stuff um, all your platform as a service um, um, infrastructure as a service all those are data centers that are out there and available they call it cloud, <laughs> what they term cloud, which basically is your data center out there. Okay, it's somebody else's um, data center. Okay, so data center could provide you virtualization, could provide you software, right? When you subscribe to Office 365, you're really running Office 365 from uh, Microsoft's cloud. Um, you know, everybody's got something out there, some form of cloud computing where they're running, they're not necessarily hosting their data center locally, they're hosting, they're having it hosted somewhere else. Reason being cost. Um, um, cost is one big thing. Um, disaster recovery, if I'm not running it and it's off premise, if something happens to the building I'm in, then, you know, my stuff is safe, um, depending on where that data center happens to be. Um, you're hoping that it's not in the same locale as you are. Okay, so, so there's many cloud models, and there's some special publications and uh, standards on define a cloud model. Okay. So you know it's an on-demand self-service broad network access, you, know, you get resource pooling. The idea is that it's a flexible way of doing it. You're paying for the flexibility of not having it on premise. So that's the idea of cloud. So here's where you get into software as a service, right, such as email. Um, a lot of places have outsourced their email, so the email is no longer hosted locally. Um, platforms as a service. Um, this responsible access development tools are used to deliver apps. Um, you could have infrastructure, you could have much of your networking and stuff uh, running through an infrastructure service. They now have, this is a new term, IT as a service. Um, IT support for all these different cloud services basically bundled with these services. I've also seen desktop as a service where they're delivering virtual desktops through here. Um, there's all the, this is like, every time I turn around there's a new term, um, but IT as a service is another one of those new terms, uh, IT support for all those 
serve all these services basically bundled in. So there's different types of cloud. There's private clouds that people maintain on their premise. There's ones that are shared, public. There's community ones. Um, so there's different types. So let's go with private. So like somebody's cloud base are offered to a private cloud for specific users or entities. Okay, whereas versus a community cloud where they're built to meet the needs for a specific energy industry. So they could be for an entire community, yeah, like a an area. So uh, public or public. Those are just public pay per use models. Um, they got government types. Okay, community clouds would be for the government, uh, healthcare, uh, media. So different types of. And just remember, these are just data centers and different that are providing services. Different types of de deployments of it. So they got a bunch of tech cloud terminology. The HCP we did, so we talked about that. That provides you with your IP address. It provides you with your IP, your subnet mesh, your gateway, your DNS servers, all that information can be provided. The idea of a hand, what it does, it does a discover, offer, request, and acknowledge. So they call it DORA. So when you turn on your sniffer, your sniffer, my sniffer is running, and so when I do it, so I release renew. So let me clear my sniffer. Clear it because there's a lot of traffic on my sniffer. I'm going to edit all the filters. Okay, I don't want the BGP traffic, EIGP traffic, HR, RIP, OSPF traffic. I just want the DHCP traffic. I'll leave ARP on there. Okay, and let's say IPv6. I want no traffic because I'm not using IPv6 right now. And I'll turn off all this traffic. I don't need any of this. I'm not using IPsec or anything. The only thing that should have been made on here is a clear all button. I didn't do that yet. It'll probably be in the next version. Uncheck all this. All I want is the DHCP traffic. Alright. It all came back. Okay, I'll leave those. Three is fine. I don't need these. Okay. So here's my DHCP traffic. So I go out, go out and ask for an address. So I do what's called the DORA. First I gotta, I do, since I don't have an IP, I usually you release usually ICMP. You first do a discover, so your IP is all Fs, destination broadcast, everywhere out there. Okay, you're requesting an IP. You're trying to discover. You sh your client address is 000. zero, zero. Okay, what you want to, what comes back to you is your definitive one, what the, the server is going to give you. You actually do a DORA. You're only seeing half the conversation. You're not seeing it from the other side. So what's happening um, is this little guy did a discover. I need an IP. This, this uh, wireless access point um, router um, said, okay, here is an IP. I want to keep it and then acknowledged it. That's what you're seeing is half of you're seeing the two that it got and there's a request and acknowledgement um, over on this side. So you're seeing half the traffic on the transaction um, off the sniffer. Um, it's hard to see the whole one because um, you're only getting only half the conversation. Um, I'd have to have something to show me what's going on on the inside of that one um, to kind of come back and tell you uh, what it got. 
Okay, it also gave it, not only did it give it the, gave it its service, its client address, the server address, it also gave it DNS. So this is, you can see the DNS traffic, it told it what DNS to use. What you didn't see was the offer and the request. Okay. Um, you got, um, you didn't see going across. You got the discover, which in, that you didn't get the rest of it. <laughs> okay, notice it's UDP traffic. Okay, so that's UDP is what it uses. Okay, it's a broadcast. It's not guaranteed no handshake. Okay. Kind of cool. Okay, so they call it the Dora. Off, discover offer request acknowledge. They call it Dora. So discover offer request and acknowledge. I can see the discover. I can see I can see the offer coming back and see the act, but I don't see what's coming off the server. I can see what I sent. Well, I see what I sent. I see what I requested, but I don't get all the traffic. Half of it's up here. The sniffer don't pick it all up. DNS we did already. Um, I showed you it's basically the yellow pages of the internet. It's you map a URL or a, a name to an IP so it can look it up. So I did that um, for you. So I got a name to IP address uh, resolution. So and I showed you how this worked. I actually showed you a query. Okay. So that's how it works. So basically, your machine doesn't understand www.google.com, nor understands numbers. So you're asking a DNS server, you know, hey, what is the IP address for this? Your resolver goes out, asks the server, it says, oh, I know what that is. And it sends you back you know, what it is. Okay. If it doesn't know what it is, it tries to go out and find it from the root name servers of the Internet. Um, these are the, sometimes you hear them, there is A through M servers out there out in the world. Those are the root main servers. If you don't know what, uh, um, if a, a server, a DNS server doesn't know what it is, it goes to their root servers. These are actually, they're A through M. Okay, and they go out there and it asks them, you know, where, the, every DNS server has a table in it that tells it where these are, and it says, well, you know, it asks it a question, you know, where are, what is the IP that I'm looking for? Um, if the root name servers don't know, nobody does, <laughs> okay, because that's where you register the root names. And you say, well, there's more than A through M. Well, there's multiples of the same letter. There might be 10 of a, of a given uh, letter. So like A has five sites, B servers have one, okay. Um, Kai, and there's eight sites here, okay, depending on what it's hosting, okay. So seven, there's 154 for L type. So L type there's 154 different servers that maintain the L records or the L type. Okay. And you can go to our home page and see um, the L roots, root servers that net. Okay, to see what they are. But that's what runs the main internet is the root servers. Generally you don't have to go there, you should have it. Okay, web servers we talked about. Um, we did the web server request using our little little network here. And one thing to note is a web page has to have an index.html. That's what you're seeing. That's the main page. Then it has sub pages, and you're doing what's called a get to get it. Okay, so when you query it, you're doing a get. Um, go get me the page. You're actually downloading that page, and then you're viewing the page. So you're actually getting it, downloading it, and viewing it. HTTP is based loosely on FTP, which we used to use F file transfer protocol, and um, mail, SMTP. Um, so if you look inside of a, a web web uh, traffic, you see a lot of, uh, of uh, things you would see in mail and or, um, let me clear this, edit the filter. See if I got HTTP. Do I leave HTTP in here? Sometimes it's in here. Do I uncheck it? There it is. Turn it on. Okay. Make clear. So you get a lot of HTTP and FTP type traffic. So I should get DNS. There's my web page. So we go back here. Take a look at the traffic. On the sniffer. So, so basically, it's just showing you the raw packets. 
Okay, so this is what it did. It did a get, got the data, and downloaded it, and that was it. It doesn't, does it expand? No, it doesn't show you all the traffic. It shows you a minor piece of the traffic. Oh, okay, it shows you the query. You get the Ethernet, the IP, the TCP, and it's going right up the stack, right? So down at the with TCP IP model, this is the bottom, right? This is the network access, then your IP layer, then your TCP, since HTTP is TCP based, and on top of it is the service HTTP, and this is the query it made. Okay, got the connection, downloaded, and was done. That's basically what happens with your standard. It gets this page and it downloads it. Okay, file services, things like file transfer protocol, that's what I meant that um, HTTP is, is like FT, has parts of FTP because you're actually downloading the web pages. Um, a lot of servers still maintain FTP um, um, pages where you can just FTP into them and not use the GUI. Um, you still can do that. Um, if you're using secure one, you're using a fit FTPS, which is a secure version of it. SSH is what we use to remote into systems and manage them uh, securely. And then secure copy is how we think, uh, copy things securely using an encrypted connection. So FTP is real common. Um, I think I got an FTP I could run on a server. So I can like turn on FTP. I think FTP is on here. So it's on. Uh, so here it is. It's full permission on there. So I could actually FTP to this server. So if I open up, I didn't know it was running on there, but we can do that. So let's go back here and go back to my desktop. Get rid of that. So I could basically say FTP um, web. It says connected to my web server. Welcome to it. Username anonymous. Okay. Okay. You need account. No such account. So what is the account on the web server? So this one. Oh, it's Cisco. Okay. Cisco is the account and the password. Is Cisco. So it's not a non-anonymous server. So I just do it again. FTP to there. It's Cisco and Cisco. So. Do, 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 invalid or not supported. Okay, so what are you supporting? Okay, so I can do a CD, a delete, a dir, a get, a help. So I can get things, I can, but I can't <laughs> list things, which is kind of funny. FTP is the current directly. That's pretty funny. Um, but I'm actually hooked into this. Okay, so I'm actually FTP'd into it. And if we look at our sniffer, you can see the traffic that I just ran. Oh, I didn't check the box. Uh, that filters. FTP. Clear. Do that again. Quit. So I'm going to FTP again. Get Cisco. Cisco. Okay. And then I can... I think it's got... So you can see the FTP traffic going. Welcome to the FTP. Now notice FTP is in a clear, so I can actually see what's going on. Okay, so username, okay, need password. So then it's all in the clear. Um, so it's not showing it, but it would show you the actual password. Username and password, and logged in. You're only getting the feedback. They're limited as to what they're showing you in the sniffer here. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Notice it's port 21. Okay, that's what you're connecting. So, how about if I get, um, let's see, what's available on an FTP server? Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see if I can get one of these. You got a couple fake packages, I think, up here. Let's do, oh no, they're real packages because I forgot you can flash those things. Say so, ASA. Uh, 842 dot dot bin. So now it's going to do a file transfer. So 
So it's moving the data. So I did a file transfer request. So open transfer starting and it's trying to transfer the data. So you can see the traffic going on here. And it's transferring. I told to go grab that. So do 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 So I thought I'd go get it slow as heck across the simulator. It's working. It's slow. Okay, but anyways, I told it to download, but notice everything's in the clear when you do that. So it's kind of cool. Take a little while to transfer. I didn't expect it. It's emulating it. Okay. That's the FTP. Now, if they had SCP, you can do it securely. I don't know if they support SSH in the simulator. I'd have to check. Probably do. That was my sniffer coming along. It's probably still transferring. Yeah, it's still running. I can kill the transfer though. Yeah, it's still going. Control C. Okay, too long. Wonder if SSH works. Yep. So I can SSH. So I got SSH running on my server. Say so if I want to get into this one, do I have SSH server running? <laughs> DNS, TFTP, syslog, AAA. Uh, that one's not running. It doesn't look like they got SSH in there. I'm gonna try. Uh, I tried the target of 64. I don't know if they emulate it or not. I'm gonna try it anyways. 1.1.51. One one okay, so it's caps. SSH dash SSH dash L. Um, Cisco. And let's try 64.1.1.e2. Yeah, they don't have SSH running. I'm going to have to figure out how they got the... They've got SSH capabilities, but I don't have it running. This is all new. This is all new services, though. This is a brand new... 7 is brand new, so... Well, anyways, SSH we use for secure connections that do on servers. So we can make secure, um, so we can manage them remotely instead of using stuff like FTP. Okay. Hold on. Printing. Uh, we love printing. So print servers are way, most copiers and printers are their own print servers. The idea is you can spool up jobs and then go ahead and uh, run them. Um, that's the idea behind them, where the, you don't have to have a dedicated server anymore. Email, right? Pop, IMAP. Remember, we talked a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to take a break at this point, and then when I come back, I think I could set this up pretty quickly. I'll set up a little pop. I think I'll do it on this one. Set up a little pop server. Let's see what they got available. Email. Yep, I can set up. SMTP is on, pop is on. So I can set up a little. Um, email server right here so you can see a little email server running so I'll have SMTP running with pop service and I gotta set it up on my client alright so when we take a 10 minute break when we come back I'll show you email and we're getting towards the end of chapter 8 and then we'll move on um, start working on chapter 9 so let's take a break Okay, I'm back. I just had to play a little bit with the email settings. I want to make sure they were working well and then the sniffers on. Okay, so I set up a mail server, uh, an email server basically, and mail browsers. So I got both PCs up and their email browsers. And I'll show you what I did. So, basically, get this out of my way. Close the chat for a minute. So I'm going to send PC1 um, should be Bob. Yeah, that's Bob. Okay. And PC0 is Eve. 
So I'm going to send, I'm going to compose email to Eve. So I made a little mailbox for Eve on a server called Eve.local. And to show you what the server, this is the actual server I made, Eve and Bob, two users on the server. And they're going to SMTP service. That's, what does SMTP do? Anybody? It does email, but what does it do specifically about email? It's for sending mail. Okay, this is how you send mail. Pop and IMAP, which they don't have IMAP on here, but Pop, that's for reading. So this is for sending, this is for reading. Okay. They happen to be on the same server in this case, but um, the POP is for reading your mail. POP doesn't send mail. SMTP does. Okay, So keep that in mind for when you're teaching your students and for the exam is that SMTP is a transport service. That is simple messaging transport. That's for sending mail. When you want to read your mail using POP or IMAP. So here I'm going to, so I've got two mailboxes on my server. Here's Eve and here's Bob. So I'm on Bob's machine. I'm going to send it to Eve. I'm going to say, hello Eve. So it's kind of fun. And then, hi. Did you see the boss? Bob. So he's going to send it. Okay. Now he sent it. Now over here, Eve is going to receive. Now she got a message from Bob. So it went through our email server. She read it with her POP3. Okay. And it says, Hi, did you receive, or did you see the boss? Okay. Receive mail from the POP3. Okay. All right, the SMTP service is what sent it across the server. Okay, so now I'm going to compose back to Bob, and I have to know Bob, Bob at local.com, and I made up the local.com. I could have made it web.com for. Uh, 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 saw him. I, Bob, saw the boss today Eve send so she sent it and he's going to go back and receive and he got the message from Pop okay so um, he, they're both reading their mail stores that are on the server using Pop service and they sent the mail using SMTP so let's take a look at our sniffer <laughs> Alright, I close my sniffers. So I put two sniffers on a line. I got one for Bob. Here's his SMTP traffic. This is when he sent. Okay, so this is what it looks like when he sends. There's the data. And then POP3 is when he received. Okay, that's when he read it. Let's go over to E's sniffer. I know it's anticlimactic. Um, is when she first read the mail, she did it with POP, okay, POP3 on port 110. Okay. Okay. And then when she, here's the destination port 110. And then she read it from 110, and then she sent him a message to Bob on 25, which is at, through SMTP. Okay. So you can see the traffic going from both Bob reading and, and Eve reading and writing. So SMTP, they're using this server, so this is the mail server as well as web server. Um, they know, they transport, they send messages using SMTP, they read them using POP. That's the difference between the two. Okay. IMAP, it doesn't, it's not in there, but it's the same idea. Okay. Using POP, instead of POP, use IMAP to read your mail. Okay. Always remember POP or IMAP read um, SMTP sense. Okay. Does that make sense? Anybody confused? No? Okay, cool. Now, I could have had two mail servers talking to each other, but it was not necessary. I just had a single one with two boxes in it. So. 
Okay, proxies. So when you have a proxy, um, the idea of a proxy is you have a when you have your web when you have a client, instead of going directly to the internet, you go through a proxy. So if you look at your um, internet options on a box, there we go. You look at I hate that it did that. You did the default page. Thank you. Um, look at your connections, look at your LAN settings, you could automatically detect or you could set it up for a proxy. What it is is it's a server, you go to a proxy, the proxy does the request for the web server or whatever resource for you, the request comes back to the proxy and then the proxy sends it to you. So we can do some fancy things with that. We can, ass we can assign uh, rules to it where um, we don't allow you to go to certain sites. Okay, so we can set rules here um, if things have changed. So this is like an intermediary between you and the internet. Um, I don't think there's a board. Do I do proxies in this thing? It might. Let me see. Real briefly. I don't know if that's one of the services provided. In email, FTP. Do, 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 no proxies. Probably some f fancy feature, but didn't have it. <laughs> okay. Um, the idea is that you have another server here that acts as a proxy. So instead of going right to the server, you go to a proxy, and the proxy does it on your behalf. That's what a proxy is. Authentication, so there's the three A's. All right, you have to know the three A's. There's authentication, who you are, authorization, what you're allowed to do, and accounting, how do you track it? Okay, so we talk about the triple A threat. <laughs> okay, authentication is not authorization, is not accounting. They're all separate. Okay, so they, they akin it to using a credit card. You're, you authenticate who you are by using the credit card. Authorization is how much you spend, and uh, accounting is what you get on your bill, unfortunately, every month. Anyways, <laughs> okay, so, um, but the idea is when you log in, you can log into a system and be authorized to do nothing. Okay, <laughs> you don't have any rights, so you can log in, but you can't do anything. But there could be an accounting of it that you logged in. Okay, authorization is what are you granted to do once you log in. So it's a triple A. Okay, IDS, they're actually getting kind of fancy here. Okay, so what is IDS? IDS is to detect if somebody, I, I, I do it this way, if anybody's seen a commercial with a security guard in a bank, so a bunch of guys, break, a bunch of people break into the bank and um, the guy, they, they go, well, the security guard's standing there, and the teller goes, well, do something. Well, I only monitor. I only detect. I don't do anything. I'm just monitoring. That's what IDS does. So built to, so it detects when there is a potential. Now, IDS can only detect what it knows. So it ha if it's got the ability to, uh, it's been updated and knows what kind of traffic looks suspicious, it'll warn you um, there is a problem. Um, so you would get a warning. Okay, It doesn't do anything other than warn you. Okay, It's like an alarm. It says, warning, I see something that I know about that's a problem. IPS stops it. Okay, it, uh, Basically, once it detects it, if you have an IPS system, it dumps the traffic or stops it. So the difference between IDS and IPS is one is passive IDS. It says, I detected it, but and I, I'm just warning you. IPS is active. I'm going to take this traffic and throw it down a dark hole. Okay, so that's the difference between that and an IDS and an IPS. Okay, some of the more famous ones um, they are like Snort. Okay, so network intrusion and prevention, it's a combo system. It not only detects, um, it, it actually can dump the traffic. So Snort is famous. It was by, Sourcefire has a, um, a variation on it. Um, I think Sourcefire got bought by Cisco recently, a couple of years ago, or a year ago. Yeah, Sourcefire. Yeah, no, Cisco owns them. Um, the idea is it uses the snort capabilities and then dumps the traffic. So, so that's some of the famous ones that are out there. Okay. Now they're making devices called UTMs, Universal Threat Management. They do everything. <laughs> they're trying to combine everything into one. 
Um, the idea with a universal threat management is they're trying to combine many functions into one device. Um, so basically, um, it is it does IDS and IPS. It does email filtering. It does proxy filtering. It does VPN. It does network access control. Um, there's a lot of UTM solutions. The idea is you have a device that can handle, rather than having separate a proxy server, um, a server for email filtering or spam filtering or something for denial, so you combine that all into a single device. So they talk about their next gen firewall with the Cisco a ASA. And it's a unified threat management, basically, or they call it universal threat management, but it's a generic term that means it combines various services into one nice package. Okay, so they have matching and why well, it's a long chapter. Preventive maintenance. Okay, so a couple things. When you're setting up, um, always look, you know, check cables. Right? Basic maintenance. Checking cables, replace worn cables, make sure there's no heat restrictions. Uh, you know, that they're not causing heat overall. So once again, every end of every chapter will have the six steps again. So you make sure your students get the six steps because that's important for the A+. Plus. You identify the problem, right? You establish a theory of probable cause. You then do test to determine the cause. You then establish a plan of action to resolve the problem and implement the solution. And then you verify full functionality and then you record it, document it. That will be on every section and like I said I would suggest to teach this is that you give them a troubleshooting um, example. So you give them a problem and have them write out a tree or basically um, make a tree trying to resolve it using the steps shown in the, in the um, curriculum. That way um, they can definitely get um, through the get through it and get the idea of what that means. So I would just give them a problem, networking problem. This problem has occurred, and you could use any kind that you decided. Um, just to walk them through um, to make sure that they're comfortable um, troubleshooting. The same steps occur again and again. Now this is uh, in particular to um, uh, networking. Um, so this one's to apply the same principles to networking, okay, and you can use many common things. You could say, you know, um, you know, how do you add, ask the question is always open versus closed end, um, and then establish a theory. You know, I can't connect to the internet. Okay, has anything changed recently? Um, did they move? Is their IP changed? Have they got a mobile? Were their IP changes? Has the NIC card changed? Is there? Is it a wireless or is it wired? Onward and off, offward. You know, where is the problem? So, basic troubleshooting. Um, but they need to know those steps pretty well so they understand how to troubleshoot. And that's applied networking. So, you did all of networking and basically um, between uh, last week and today. So, those chapter 7 and 8. One's applied um, and one is the background, like the hardware, and one's the applied applying. Um, um, so, um, what you learned about hardware in an environment. Okay, was this helpful to you? This kind of tie it together a little bit, sort of, kind of. Okay, I would suggest you you know download the um, the packet tracer and try some of this. Just trying to build little environments and try out the the stuff. It's not hard. It's like you had real hardware. Um, you know, just trying to make little connections. You don't have to know the Cisco IOS to do this. Um, you can do this using just the little GUIs. I know when, when you learn networking, you will learn the Cisco IOS and only use the Cisco IOS, not the GUI. But for this little exercise, just to practice. Um, you know I mean, because there's no test on IOS, Cisco IOS on the exam, but um, it kind of gives you an idea of how you hook up devices when you don't really have devices to hook up. Um, kind of walks you through what DNS, DHCP, and you can set up all these little services and watch they do. And they have the little sniffers, which I thought were a little more extensive, but maybe I have to ask Justin if they've improved it. They only show you like the stack, but they don't give you more detail than what I, what I like to see. Um, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so. 
All right, moving on. Okay, we're going to move on to laptops and mobile devices. Okay, this is something we were supposed to start today, which is fine. We still got plenty of time this week. Um, we're not scheduled uh, to be done till Friday. And I'm on Chapter 9, and we have Chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Um, Friday, the, the four, Chapter 14 is really just a troubleshooting chapter, so that doesn't take um, enormous amount of time. Um, let's see. Let me look. On. So we got this week, uh, 5, 6, 7, 8, and... Let me see where I'm going here. Let's see, I got 5, 6, 7, yeah. So on the 8th, I'm sorry, we're done on the 8th. But it doesn't take excessive on 14 and 13. Not too bad. So we'll do 9 today. I'll probably do 10, 11 tomorrow, uh, 12, and then partially 13. We'll be done by Friday with no time. With no, with no uh, difficulties, and then we can do a wrap up on Friday if anybody has additional questions before I um, take you to what you're going to do next, which is the final exam for this class. So, okay, so let me go ahead and move forward. Okay, so we're going to talk about laptops, and one thing I gave you in the curriculum, um, if you remember, let me go back to the main class before I jump into nine here. Modules give you a virtual. I think I'm going to save this packet tray so I can use it tonight. I got to teach the same thing to my students. Uh, save as packet tracer packet. Okay, put it on my desktop. I might have them build this environment just because I want them to practice what networks are. I might have my do that Penzo rambunctious there. Let's see if they can do it. Okay. I'll keep them busy. Uh -huh. There we go. Okay. So I give you the virtual laptop. Dun, 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 it's actually pretty good. Now with the virtual, um, um, with the exam, the A-plus exam, they expect you to be able to identify lights on the laptop, different ports, but just like you would a desktop. And they'll have you interact with it to kind of identify um, um, what's going on or what to do. Um, so it's very cool. So you go ahead and go through this. Once it downloads, three seconds. Network is slowing down since uh, more people have been on it and they've been doing quite a bit of work with it. Let's see how it works today. Sometimes I work, sometimes I run into problems, we'll see. I've got another build if I run into a problem. A lot of the time my browser won't open some of these. Should, but... Let me go back to modules, back to that module. Let's see if it didn't. Come on, baby. Open it up. Worked better when I used to use an older browser, but a lot of my security features are killing, because it's Java. I'm <laughs> killing, killing this stuff. Uh, I keep an old copy because I can. Uh, because I tend to upgrade my security and then things start to have problems. This is an older version. There we go. It's an older version. This, this version seems to like me. So you have this ability to, if you don't have hardware, this ability, once again, it's a virtual laptop. So you can do battery, RAM, RAM access, hard drives, all that, and even the old uh, wireless um, cards. Um, so you can they can practice without having um, um, any kind of uh, uh, equipment to use. So you want to replace the battery, you have to unlock it, unlock it, and then it removes the battery. So simple stuff like that to get them into the groove of how to remove the battery. Okay, and then they move on from there. So that's the top. So 
they do the battery did the battery and then you do the RAM and so forth and so on but the idea is you can use that in your class let's talk about laptops close that up leave Mr. Laptop running here I don't need that dome anymore okay back to when I finished 8 so I'm going to switch that lever down to make my life easier let's go down at 9 so I can keep track of where we're at so I can confuse things real easy. Okay, I'm going to shrink this down because I'm done with that. Down. Okay. So mobile. Now mobile, remember, is not only laptops anymore. So you're going to start seeing phones and tablets in here. Some key things they want you to get out of this when they when you're learning it is what are the different symbols mean? Bluetooth. Guide our, and then what is battery status, LED, sleep mode, or standby LED. Okay, what are these different colors, ports, right? This is probably you won't see anymore. <laughs> Parallel port, they still mention it. It's lucky you see that battery. Okay, you'll be lucky you see one anymore in power input. But they want you to kind of go through and know the types of batteries there are. Uh, we typically use lithium ion. Um, that's what we use now. We don't usually use the nickel metal hydrides anymore, but sometimes they come across. And then we have the new lithium poly polymers um, that they're um, they're small, lightweight, um, um, but they haven't been quite as popular as these. And these are very old and old Nike heads. Okay, so. The LED display on laptops are typically the most expensive part of a laptop. Okay, so they want you to know all the ports: PS2s, RJ45. So I would just review these with RJ11 for a modem. Good lord! <laughs> audio microphone jack, audio jacks, vents. Okay. PCMCIA. Good luck if you ever find one of those again. <laughs> um, it's rough to see those anymore. But they want you to be able to identify them by sight still. Because you still have people with older laptops. Okay, so you have vent holes, speakers, infrared if you have infrared, and so forth and so on. Then right side, they take you through, BGA out, CD ROM, DVD. And on the bottom, this at the interface, they may not ever see is interface for a docking station. Um, sometimes you have a docking station you can uh, plug into. Um, not often. And this is the um, unlocks. Now we call them port replicators on the back. Um, you don't mean, okay, this is for the hard drive if the hard drive slides out. So they just want them to get familiar with all the pieces. Common inputs, so they talk about the different buttons. So you have the trackpad of naturally, um, biometrics, um, you have the <laughs> eraser, I like to call it, but it's the pointing device. <laughs> That's part of the keyboard. Okay, so the keyboard with the, and, and, uh, you've got this, uh, I like to call it the eraser, basically. It's another um, way to manipulate your mouse. Um, you have your power buttons, and you have your different um, volume controls. Now, this is, granted, this could, you could have webcam on there. There's different things you could have on these devices. This is where I've seen before the icons, uh, Bluetooth, caps lock, knowing what the icons mean, uh, power on LED, hibernator sleep standby mode, hard drive access mode, okay, num lock, okay, with the number one in it. They want you to know all the different pieces and battery. Um, if you saw this, how would you know this is wireless? Okay, and if you have a slide switch, um, LEDs vary by model, but sometimes people accidentally turn off their wireless not knowing. Um, there was one model had a, if you touched here, it would actually shut the wireless. Some had side switches. Um, there's all kinds of things like that. Laptops have microphones typically um, and web webcams. So when you look at it, they have very much the same thing, just smaller, right? So you had a big desktop motherboard we learned about. Now we have laptop motherboards, much smaller. They take RAM, but not the full size like we have in a motherboard. They use SODIMs. CPUs are probably pretty much um, equivalent. Um, they do modify. If you're running on battery, they throttle down the speed for purposes of conserving battery. 
but um, you know, at one time there was a big. This was like a, a mountain range between the two. Laptops typically lagged extremely behind the processing power of a desktop. Now you can't say that anymore. Storage typically you have large storage as well as speed. So these laptops nowadays have become equivalent to uh, desktops almost, almost exactly. I mean, you can buy a lot of features just like you can on a on a laptop on a desktop. Okay, things have come quite a ways over the years. Okay, this is a dim, but a so dim, small outline dim. So it's the same dual inline memory module, just smaller. Okay, special function keys, different function keys do different things. Um, so what they want you to see is that you can hit function F7 uh, with, for uh, the display. Now, is that universal? Um, it used to say function F8, <laughs> okay, for display switch. Um, here they're showing function F7, um, but I have typically use function F8. Um, it varies depending on, oh, typically function F8 um, does that. Um, Twitches when you play. This is function F7 on this one, but typically it's function F8 to switch for or for external display and internal displays. Um, it, that's just the toggle. Okay, I don't know why they put F7 there. Typically it's an F8 key. Okay. Docking station versus port replicator. This is an old IBM dock. Um, I remember these. So you would power on the dock. This had the ability to put a full hard drive in it. It's for ejection. And this is where you would set the laptop. It would give you more ports on the back and the ability to actually put a hard drive in here. Um, and you had quite a bit of uh, ports on the back. Um, you would power through here to keep your laptop charged. You had a parallel serial ports. Um, you can actually diskette drive for diskette driver. <laughs> um, DVI, VGA. Okay, you had your PS2s versus what we use now, which is really a port replicator. They're not showing it. Um, which is, this is just to key lock your laptop down. Port replicators are typically in the back, and they usually add functionality. You can't put hard drives in them, but they add more ports, typically. Um, you can extend your ports or add more ports. Um, dockings you don't see too much, as much as you're used to anymore. Um, because people, you know, this was made basically when you went back to the office so you can turn your laptop into a full desktop you'd have an actual you know full keyboard mouse and your laptop would sit there so there's a research one I typically assign all these labs to make them do research on the different technologies um, they don't require any kind of hands-on they just need to do the research on it um, so they know what the what the, what's out there in laptop technology Common techniques for the actual LCD panels is you got your twisted pneumatic and in plane, and what they they want you and organic is very popular and commonly used for mobile devices, um, especially for phones and cameras. Um, some laptops it has it in there. Um, it's very popular. Uh, every pixel is individually lit so they want you to kind of look at it and read through this for laptops. Um, Displays are everything uh, with the laptop. They cost the most to replace. Um, they typically also laptop uh, displays. The screen itself has a tube. It's usually backlit and it's AC, though the laptop is DC, so they use a converter. Um, you're going to learn about that in the curriculum to convert uh, the DC to AC. Um, because you have to drive a tube behind them to backlight them. So they'll talk about that. Um, you know, now they got super IPS. Okay. Okay. A lot of times with the displays, how do you want to look at? It? Depending on some are better than others in bright light, some are less. Depends. Just never use any kind of ammonia products to clean it. Windex or anything like that that will scratch or and or mar um, the display. This is the inverter. This is what I'm talking about. There is a tube. Um, they don't produce light by themselves, so you have to uh, 
you have to convert DC to AC and they use this converter called a um, inverter um, they're typically there it's all in the display this is actually in the display typically it's not removable it's part of the display um, they're not fluorescent it's just the backlight um, it's to provide that brightness you see and then the inverter plugs into it that's usually on the side of the display um, it usually looks like this this is the inverter board okay um, it uses two common types of backlights that actually give you the brightness are CCFLs and LED types okay and typically they are not um, replaceable the inverter board is but not the actual you have to change the whole display okay the backlights um, since they don't produce them at enough they basically give you the 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 um, the lighting behind it um, and then uh, um, that's how you get the brightness on the display otherwise you'll a lot of times if you turn on a laptop and you you see a display but it's not bright and you can't turn it up it's because the bulb is gone and you have to replace the whole display Wi-Fi antennas nowadays we don't use externals typically the antennas actually wrap around a display um, that's where they're placed now they're encased in, in, uh, in around the display itself and then they usually fish underneath through the display down to the bottom where you have your WLAN connectors. Um, these um, usually, um, you got to have <laughs> really nimble hands because they drive me crazy sometimes to put these back in. It is a replaceable card. Um, they push down connect. These we actually remove and they push down. Make sure you put them in the right order. <laughs> and, you know, don't put the red over here and the white over there. It doesn't work right. <laughs> and this is actually like a a snap down card at a 45 degree angle okay there's usually wire guides as they said they just don't hang loosely you gotta be mindful because the front basal of the display will come off it's usually plastic around here when you're removing that it's usually four screws or two screws and the snaps uh, that there is a wire that runs across there and also you have to watch for the camera that's usually mounted at the top that you don't damage anything while removing the front basil um, while you're trying to take it apart got your webcam and your mic okay so usually you have your webcam and your mic you have the picture and that a lot of people get paranoid to put tape over that to make sure the webcam's not watching them <laughs> um, they may put the mic inside here they may put the mic down here it depends um, depends on where they want to put the mic you put it in all different places so. Okay, the big thing is these states. Uh, make sure you know your power states. And make sure your students know the ACPI power states. Um, I've seen numerous uh, questions about power states. Um, SO means that it's on and it's running. S1, uh, CPU and RAM are running, but unused devices are powered down. S2 state. A CPU is off, RAM is refreshed, the system is in lower mode than S1. So the CPU can go into it can be turned off while you're while it's working. Um, it does not need to be actually on. It can go into sleep um, while it's working. It's still functional. S3 is where the uh, CPU is off, RAM is set to slow refresh rate, and the mode is often called save the RAM. This is known as a suspend when you suspend operations. Um, S4 is usually hibernation, they call it save the disk or hibernate mode. And an S5 state is one that's completely off. They want you to know different ACPI states. I, they didn't used to make you measure, memorize these, but if you had to memorize them, now it's good. S0 is completely on, S5 is completely off. And then you have different gradual states as you go down. Hibernate is this. S4, this is sleep mode, S3. When you say save the RAM, that's sleep. Not all applications sleep. Some of it has trouble. Some things have issues when they sleep. You may have to switch to hibernate. Either sleep or hibernate. Don't do both. <laughs> okay, typically you hibernate. Um, things will come back by spinning the platter and bringing the, or SSD drive and bringing the stuff off the stored um, hard drive. Okay, whatever is on a hard drive. So hibernate, sleep. Um, this usually works fine. The CPU is off, but RAM is refreshed. It's still operating. Um, unused devices powered down. They could literally power down your drive at this point if it's um, not necessary. So knowing the different levels and states. You can manage them in the BIOS. Um, 
different system states. Um, you can turn it on, turn it off. Um, you have thermal management. Um, batteries typically, um, the lithium ions run hot, especially when they're charged. Um, so be mindful. Um, they've gotten better. They don't blow up or anything like that or, or, or break that way. They used to be pretty bad. Um, in terms of overheat, um, you couldn't literally keep the thing on your laptop. Um, so you had to be careful when you had lithium ion and were charging them. Um, they would overheat. Um, so be mindful of that. Um, wake on land, not everybody has this, but the idea of waking up a notebook or a device by just sending a magic packet to it to wake it up. And that's typically in your BIOS setting. This is usually on. They try to set the if you still have BIOS and UEFI, there's still power management settings. So I'll make sure they know this cold <laughs> so they don't have um, any issues about what the different S, uh, S's because that will be something they will be asked. A lot about power. Um, this is interesting, managing your power. Um, typically it's going to be very conservative when you're on battery. It's going to, um, you can set different settings depending on what you want to do, but you know, typically it's going to be quite aggressive. If you say maximize for battery life, they're going to be aggressive about turning things off. If you want to maximize performance, they're going to be less aggressive about turning things off because if you turn things off, it doesn't run at full power. Um, so you can do a couple options, sleep, hibernate, shut down, um, all kinds of different settings depending on your need. Um, they still have these settings even on, on desktops. Um, even now, uh, there are still power options on desktops. So right now it's in balance mode or power saver mode. Um, you can choose when you know, what the power button does. If I hit the power button, what does it do? When I press it shuts down. I can sleep, hibernate, or do nothing. So um, I have different choices what I can do with the power button. Um, you can create your own par custom power plan. Right now it's unbalanced. Um, you can do power power saver. You can do high performance. Uh, you use more energy on high performance. Um, so you have very, very different ways um, you can run this, whether you're dis how long till your display turns off, how long till you sleep. Um, there's also advanced settings that you can do even more. So with this, um, require a password to wake up, it's set the yes, hard disk, turn off the hard disk after, and it says never, but you could spin it down, i.e., um, you can do a, a max, it's maximum performance. Wireless, if you have a wireless, what's the saving mode? You know, do you power off the wireless? Do you sleep? So there's a lot of different options on power settings. They've, um, they've emphasized this a little more than they have in the past because the need of cons uh, saving power or greenness. So they've had quite a bit. I just showed you the advanced settings. Okay. Now, just a couple things about batteries. Batteries do not last forever, and typically what people make the mistake is they keep their ba their laptop plugged in all the time and never run the battery down. Bad idea. <laughs> okay. Run your battery down. Okay. You do not want to stay on AC all the time um, because the batteries get, even though they say they don't do it, they do, after, over time, start reducing their effectiveness of keeping a charge. So what happens is they, they deteriorate. Batteries are typically the second most expensive thing on a laptop or on any device. You need to zero out your, your stuff. I know you don't like it that it's going to power off, but um, it'll save you headaches in the long term. Um, make sure you allow devices to run completely out periodically to flush them. Otherwise, they think um, what happens is an old old thing that happens is we used to call it the memory effect. Or I used to call it memory effect, but is if you have a battery... And when you bought it new, this was 100%. This is 0%. If you never let it run down and you keep plugging it in, what happens is the 0% creeps up. So what it thinks is 0% can get as high as here. You now effectively have reduced your battery's life by this much. Okay, By letting it run all the way down, you're basically maintaining that zero point at the bottom.
that. Love advice for anything that's battery powered. If you keep it plugged in, it doesn't know how to zero out. Batteries usually, they won't even warrant GM after one year. Um, you can buy extended for money, extended support, but typically they don't keep them more than one year because they know that they don't, they don't uh, survive well in long term. Okay, Bluetooth, which has come back into favor. <laughs> okay, if you have Bluetooth, um, the short range wireless become very popular again. Um, IoT devices, um, people who like to jog, um, uh, uh, things like Fitbits and um, walking and all that. It's become popular. It's not only restricted to just your headsets, so it's become popular once again. Cellular WAN, right? You can make your personal hotspot on your phones. Um, that's something you don't have to tether like you used to, where you had to hook your phone up to your machine. Now you can just um, use your phone as a wireless access point, basically as a personal hotspot. If you have, um, hopefully, you have unlimited uh, data, <laughs> or limit. but or you can get your own hot spot um, you can get these little devices if you don't want to use a, your phone you can use a you can you could basically pay per month for a, a hot spot that you can carry around with you Wi-Fi comes in all kinds of forms right these are the mini connectors that typically are in lab laptops mini PCI mini PCIe and then PCI Express micros are typically in laptops um, all of them do the same thing it's just different sizes Expansion cards are kind of limited. Um, they don't give you a lot anymore. Um, these are what they used to call express cards. <clears throat> they typically don't give you those slots anymore on a, on a notebook anyways. Um, on older ones, it was fairly popular. Um, we used to use it quite a bit um, to expand. You'd add hard drives that way, wireless, all kinds of things. You typically don't get that um, as much anymore. You don't see these express card slots on most notebooks. Most people want light and thin, so they don't, inst they don't have those slide slots like they used to. Flash USB, flash card, flash readers. Um, okay, just to note, they are hot sloppable, but don't just pull them out. You should turn it off by using proper technique. When you go to the USB, okay, when you go to your USB, make sure you stop them um, before you unplug them. Don't just pull them out. Um, it's a good idea because over time, if you just pull them out, they will corrupt. Um, there's a lot of external storage. Depends on what. This USB is probably the most common. So before you eject, like my data traveler here, um, you know you should stop it. Okay, first and say, oh, it's okay. Safe to remove now. Before you take it out. <laughs> 